everybody. Good to see you. I've just got a couple of little announcements. First of all, we have um, Pastor Donald's books up at the back there um, after the service. And as he said, please don't leave without buying one. And also, we have Pastor Daniel and the Liars books as well. And uh, he's written two books. We've got the first one here, which is Worship of the Sword, which was written about 13 years ago. And that's his testimony of uh, his life up until that point, and uh, well, up until Saudi Arabia, everything that happened in Saudi Arabia, the wonderful miracles that happened. It's absolutely marvellous reading. I have read it twice, I think. And um, it's exciting. And this one here, this one is also written by Pastor fairly recently, um, the 21st century cultural war in the West. And that does include some of the events in his first book, but uh, there's a lot more to read out about. It's really about um, how to handle Islamic culture and what's happening and how he handled it and, and what he did. So uh, that's really, really uh, a really great book too. And it does tell us, um, it gives us some insight into um, Islamic way of life. Now, those books are only $15. Uh, they're on the other table. We also have some CDs of last night's meeting. So we've done those as well. Are they CDs or DVDs? I'm not quite sure. But <clears throat> anyway, they're only $5 each. So if you weren't here and you missed last night's meeting or you'd like to get one for a family member or a friend or whatever, or post one to somebody, they're at the back, they're $5, and you can order them. So, and we'll also have some tonight. We'll just have to hang around a little bit longer if you want to get tonight's meeting as well. Now, this is really exciting. Who hasn't been to Israel? That's a lot. Wow. Well, we've got a lot of potential customers here because... This is um, the Reformation Harvest Fire Ministries tour to Israel. And it's a 12-day tour, all-inclusive. 12 days, is that right? 12 days, all-inclusive. It's under $5,000 for everything. And the stop off at Sri Lanka. And uh, there's lots of places in Israel, including Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Bethlehem. You get to see the... Uh, um, Lake of Galilee, you get to see the Jordan River, you might even get a dunk in it if you're lucky. You know, I mean, it's awesome. If you haven't been, it's a really, really wonderful experience. You know, to walk some of those places where you know that Jesus walked, to be in the Sea of Galilee, that was my... I felt really, really close to the Lord in the Sea of Galilee because I knew he was there. I mean, other things, other places change. But something like the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River... And uh, those, those places don't change. You know that that's where Jesus was. Even his walk, you know, um, uh, when he walked uh, to the crucifixion, you knew that that happened. And you just felt part of it. And it was really, really an awesome, powerful experience. And I think $5,000 is pretty good, don't you? And this, this is coming up in September. So you've got plenty of time to save up. It's only January. And so this will be in September. The tour starts at the 16th of September. So this year, 16th of September, this year. So who wants to go? Well, well we have got... We, we have got these brochures. This uh, tells you all about it at the last couple of pages. It's actually where you can... Uh, Write down all your details, make an application, etc. And um, just see me after, or one of the ladies up there. And if we haven't got enough of these, we can print you out some. Okay? So please see us after the service. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Right. Good morning, morning. 
Atunci ne-a luat cu el, să rezi de oameni iglesie, să-i plâns cu el, de la asta. Sunt hormonii. Hai, în exclusiv, eu vă mulțumesc că eu vă mulțumesc și eu vă mulțumesc. Asta trebuie să pot să-i. Fii de ce o vă mulțumesc. And in the valley of 
Ela is the largest satellite farm in the world. Hundreds of satellites for television. Some of them uh, the size of two or three hundred feet high, three or four hundred feet wide, huge satellites. And that is the central point where signals are beamed up to a satellite beamed back down to Israel. And then Israel sends it back up to different parts of the world. Like for SBN, for here in Australia, our satellite goes from Baton Rouge, our signal goes from Baton Rouge to Nashville, Tennessee, shot up 22,000 miles into the sky, shot back down 22,000 miles to Israel, who shoots it back up because of the curvature of the earth they cover and it's quite amazing and so we, we, we drove up and uh, when you walk in when you walk into the main office it's unreal because they're literally they are feeding the signal for literally thousands of television channels and networks and I mean you walk in and you're hearing German you're hearing Italian you're hearing French you're hearing Spanish you're hearing Portuguese you're hearing it's like all these different languages. And when you walk in, they've got a monitor set up of about probably 300 television screens of all different sizes. And, and all those screens are whatever they're sending up, whatever they're receiving, whatever they're sending up, so they can monitor the picture. And we walked in, and the guy waiting for it, the guy, I'll never forget his name, typical Jewish name. His name was Shmuley. And he was the general manager of all of this satellite. And so we walked in. He was greeting us. And I happened to look up, and right there in the middle was SBU. And to, to realize that where David killed Goliath was now the central hub for getting the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I think God's got a sense of humor. After the service, go back to the table. How many of you were not here last night? Okay, well, I just have to tell you, we locked the doors. No, I'm not joking. We will lock you in. And the only way you're getting out is if you go to the table and buy something. It's the only way. You don't, you don't want to buy, just hope you got a sleeping bag. Because you'll be here in the morning. But I have two things with me. I have, first of all, uh, my dad's life story entitled Amazing Grace. And you'll want to read that. It's a tremendous book. And then I have my, one of my dad's newest CD. And, you know, uh, you've probably seen it advertised on SBN. But, you know, our cousin, Jerry Lee Lewis, one of the founders of Rock and Roll, and the, one of the original inductees of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, one of 15 artists to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and in the Country Music Hall of Fame as well. Only 15 in America to have that honor. And you know, he lived a rough life, but about two years ago, the Lord got a hold of him. And they his heart back to the Lord, and he passed away just a few months ago. But the last album he got to record was a duet with him. And it's entitled The Boys from Fairy. That's Fairy, Louisiana, where they were born and raised. And uh, he, the last album he ever recorded, and I tell you, you know, he was so at peace, and uh, you could tell that his life had been changed. And so they're back there, and uh, it'll bless you. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's going to be a collector's item, I can tell you that right now. And, uh, you know, Dad has sold a little over 20 million recordings. I've sold. You know, you know, you know without a doubt you cannot sing. When you start singing in the privacy of your house and your dog gets up and leaves the room, that's a pretty good sign that you're not making a joyful noise unto the Lord. I had an English bulldog for 10 years. His name was Boudreaux. That's a good old French name. We're 
French in South Louisiana with Cajuns. And we still got people from South Louisiana that speak French. It's not the French spoken in France, but it's French. And uh, we've got a unique culture in South Louisiana. And so I, I, I've gone to Arkansas with one state over to get him. I got him when he was two months old. As soon as we crossed the state line into Louisiana, I stopped the car and I rebuked the spirit of Arkansas. I, I don't want an Arkansas bulldog. It's got to be a Louisiana bulldog. And I named him Boudreaux. And, you know, and, and Boudreaux was, was, he was just, well, you know, English bulldog. They're just big babies, and they're lazy. They are flat out lazy. He would, uh, in the mornings, you have to get him up, and we'd go out, I'd come back in, and I would study, and I had a, in one of the guest bedrooms and downstairs where I, I'd go, and I'd lay on the floor and pray. And so one morning, I was laying there praying, and I felt some hot air. And I opened my eyes, and he's laying down staring at me. And I said, now, Boudreau, you're a year old now. It's time that I explain the plan to stop This is how you get saved. Explain the plan to stop it. I said, I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer. He barked, so he got saved. I don't think he ever got sanctified. And number two, he definitely didn't get baptized. You cannot baptize an 80-pound bulldog. They are not going under the water. And uh, But we had him 10 years until I had to put him down. And, uh, that cancer and diabetes and a lot of other things. But, uh, and you know, I, I'm a, I love dogs, but I'm amazed at how some people act around dogs. They treat them like babies. They treat them like humans. They're not humans. They are dogs. Hello? They do provide companionship, but you don't sleep with them. You don't dress them up. You don't make videos of them. They are dogs. And, uh, but anyway, go back to the table. We only got a few things left, so pick them up. And uh, there'll be a blessing to you. Open your Bibles tonight to the fifth chapter of John's Gospel. John chapter 5. It's good to be here in Australia. This is the 12th trip uh, that I've made to Australia over the years. And I love this country. And we pray for Australia. Uh, God has done in the past uh, a, a great work in this country, but there is yet great things to come, because we have the promise of the Lord in the last days, I will pour out on my spirit upon all flesh, and, uh, and I, I, it's so good to, as well to be with Danny, known him for many years, and uh, he's been a blessing, and you, if, if you are in the area, you live in this area, but you don't go to church, you come back and visit when the meetings are over and be a part of what the Lord is doing. But he's a godly man. He loves the Lord with all of his heart. He has a tremendous power. He is truly, truly, I think one of his greatest gifts is as an intercessor. And seeking the Lord and praying. And uh, he's a godly man. And he loved him. He loved him. And that's uh, John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. After this, speaking of the events of chapter 4, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethsaida, having five words. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that it had been now a long time at that case, he said unto him, Will you be made whole? What a question. 
The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another step is down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. I want to minister for a few minutes tonight a message entitled, The House of Grace and Mercy. The house of grace and mercy. Well, how do you come up with that from that text? Oh, it's there. It's there. I'll tell you in a moment. Father, we come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus. We thank you for the privilege that we have to minister the Word. We thank you for the privilege to be here with these three. Lord, we would pray and ask for your anointing. Anointing upon me to minister and anointing upon these your people to hear, to receive, and to understand. Lord, I don't know these people by name. I don't know the circumstance of their life. I don't know the situations that they may be involved in and the needs represented. But I pray, Lord, that something we say, something that is said as we minister tonight, would be a word of hope. A word of life. A word of encouragement. And we give you all the praise and glory. And everybody said, Amen. 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 When you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are many words that one can come up with to describe Jesus Christ and the things that He does. But there's one word that I think that just sums up everything, and that is change. When Jesus steps on the scene, He changes everything. He could change death into life. Poverty into prosperity. He could change darkness into light. He could change hopelessness into hope. He could change sorrow into joy. There's nothing that Jesus Christ cannot change. I don't know what problems you're facing tonight. I don't know the situations of your life. I don't care what the doctor said. I don't care what lawyers have said. I don't care what anybody said. Jesus Christ can change your circumstance. I remember years ago, I, I was playing for several years with migraine headaches. And I had the worst of the worst uh, and if you if you've never experienced a migraine headache, it's it's uh, I, I don't really know how to describe it. It is like somebody taking an axe pick and stabbing you in the eye. It is it is pain so sharp uh, I, I I can't really explain it. There's no pain like I, I would get to the point where I would and I would literally see crystals floating in the air. I would have times that I would I could not stand the light. I would have to be in a completely darkened room. My brain, the, the intensity would get to the point that I would get so sick that I literally could not stand up. So dizzy, the room would spin. I, I would have, as I said, I would crawl that I turned the lights off. Pitch like I'll put the air conditioner on 50 degrees. Because the colder it is, the it helps me. And at times I would take my fist and I would just push it as hard as I could into my forehead. I would get so sick that I would throw up the contents of my stomach, but yet it wouldn't stop. I got to where I was throwing up the intestinal juices, which eats your stomach. But it was bad. And I remember the doctors telling me, we don't know what causes migraines, and we really have no cure. Now this was done, they've had some breakthroughs in the last few years with migraine medicine, but I'm talking 30 some years ago. And back then, all that they could do was they could do two things. Number one, they had to give me a shot every single week. I had to have a shot. And then and that shot contained medicine that would that would Reload your body of medicine, but it wouldn't stop the migraines. But it would temper the intensity of the pain. And then every day I had to take—I called it a horse pill. It's a huge pill. 
once again putting certain medicines into your body. I probably wound up in the emergency room because of migraines probably seven or eight times. Numerous times. Dad, mom, and dad, they live next door. They live next door. One good thing about having your parents live next door, when you've got little kids, you can tell them, hit the road. Go see your grandparents. And, uh, and, and I, I, I can't tell you how many times that, that I would pick up the phone and call my dad and say, Dad, I'm hurt. you got to pray. And yet, every Sunday morning at Family Worship Center, and you've seen it on television, we pray for the sick. Now, I mean, we have seen, we've seen cancers. We've seen disease healed. We've seen God touch hearts and lives in miraculous ways. And many times on that Sunday, those Sunday mornings, I would step out with oil on my finger. Even then, under the effects of a prior migraine. And I would pray for people. And then I would turn to one of our pastors and say, anoint me with oil. And I mean, over the years, I probably was anointed with enough oil he could float a battleship. I mean, just get, but nothing happened. And I, I remember I was, I was leaving to go to Johannesburg, South Africa. I've been to South Africa 27 times over the years in Britain. And I love South Africa. And, and I was going there, and I, I almost canceled the trip because I was going through just a really serious time of those migraines. It was getting to the point that they were coming on a regular basis. And there's nothing worse than being sick in a foreign country. I mean, it's not... It's, 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 matter of fact, I wound up in the hospital here in Australia. You know, before I had my back surgery and uh, my back went out on me. Y'all got some crazy doctors. You got some crazy rules too, I tell you. And uh, anyway. Now I almost I almost said, you know, I don't I don't wanna I don't wanna chance it. I don't wanna get in a foreign country and, and be incapacitated. Especially now. And and I, I but I but I prayed about it, but I felt in my spirit my schedule and I just want to go. And so I, I went. And then one good thing I do help, Johannesburg is a mile high in altitude. And the higher the altitude, the better it is for my grandson. And I thought, well that will help. And right before I got there and, and, and you know I there were a few times I could feel one coming on, but but thank the Lord it never really manifested itself. And when I would go to South Africa back then, I would stay ten days. I would get there on a on a, a Wednesday, and I would start preaching. When I preach Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, I'd take Monday off, and I'd preach Tuesday, Wednesday. I'd take Thursday off, and I'd preach Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then leave and go home. And it was the Monday. Of the first weekend, after the first weekend of service, I had that day off. And I was, a, I, as I told you last night, I've been a runner above a walker now. But I was a runner for over nearly 40 years. And it started when I was in my early 20s. And, and I, I would run seven miles a day. And I was staying right downtown Johannesburg. And I woke up before daylight, got dressed to go run. I, since I was staying downtown, I would try to get out before the traffic built. And I, I was walking out the door. And I looked down, and one of my bags was laying on the ground. And I saw that this was a long time ago. This was when we listened to cassette tapes. Do y'all remember cassette tapes? That means you're old. Do you remember any tracks? You're really old. <laughs> Kids nowadays, you show them an LP, they go like, that's the biggest CD I've ever seen in my life. But it's amazing. The older you get, things come around. Vinyl's coming back. Matter of fact, we're releasing a vinyl next month. And a special edition. And anyway, uh, and so I, I, I saw a wall. Remember those old, you know, 
Now, now I put my earbuds in my ear and my phone in my pocket and I got 8 billion songs. Or I listen to satellite radio on my phone. It's amazing technology. And I invented it all. And anyway, I, I, I look, I saw this wall, I remember it was bright yellow. And you had the old headphones, you remember that? With the puppy pads on it. And, and I and I looked and I saw it and I remember and I never I never ran with a walk. Just get my life didn't like hold And I remembered I when I was packing, I grabbed the walkman and said, Well I may need this. Well I never listened to it, but I threw it in the back. And I was walking out the door and I saw that walkman and I stopped. Reached down and I picked it up and there was a cassette in it. Now I did not put that cassette in. That's the honest truth. I did not put that cassette in. And I looked down at it and it was a sermon my dad had preached in the 1960s entitled, I love, you know, my dad is a great preacher, but he is, he is phenomenal when it comes to sermon titles. I mean, he's the master at sermon times. I know somebody who knows somebody who knows what to do for you. The giant will fall. Five missiles and atomic bombs in the second coming of Jesus Christ. I mean, he can come up with, I mean, sometimes I get plug promise on the message, I can't get a title. I walk into his office and say, here's the verse, give me a title. Change, change, claim. I mean, he just got, he, they just come out. And, and, and I looked down and it was a message entitled, I left this pea patch my last time. And it was a story of Shamgar and his ox goat when the Philistines would come down to, to rob the children of Israel and steal their crops. And Shamgar was out bringing in the harvest with that ox goat cutting down lentils. And the Philistines began to raid, and the man of God said, I've had it. God gave me this land. God gave me this crop. And I'm sick and tired of dirty heathen dogs coming down and stealing it. And the Bible said that an anointing of the Holy Spirit came upon Shamgar, and he took that ox goat and he slew the Philistines. And I, said, and I saw that, I said, man, I haven't heard that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to listen to it. So I put the headphones on and I went out and I started running. Plug and punch on, start. And, and, and you'll understand something. I don't, I, I don't know how many times I have been prayed for for these migrants. I, I mean, so many times I just forgot. I mean, I mean just and nothing, nothing. But there's something about perseverance. There's something about that says, I may not get it today. I may not get it tomorrow. I may not get it this week. I may not get it next week. But I don't, and I will not stop believing. It's the, I call it the perseverance of faith. There comes a time in the life of every believer when you don't feel like it. You're beaten down. You're broken. It seems like everything is going at the devil. I mean, I 
started picking them up and putting them down. I started speaking in tongues out loud while I was running. I mean, tears were rolling down my chest. I knew I was healed. I knew that I was healed. The Lord changed. He changed that situation. That was well over 30 something years ago. And I've not had a migraine not one time since then. So there's nothing that God cannot change. He can change your sorrow into joy. He can give you hope when there is hopelessness. When you read the Gospels, and you read these stories like I read tonight, and these miracles performed by the Lord, never read them as just an event that happened in history. Read them in light of what the Lord did for that person. He can do it for you. Always read it that way. And as well, whatever the subject matter of the events that you read in the Gospels and, and that involve the Lord, the meaning is always far greater than what you read. The Bible said that it was, now notice the terminology, and most people don't pay attention to what they read. That's the reason why when you study the Word of God, before you read one word, you need to ask the Holy Spirit to help you. To rightly divide the Word of truth. It said the feast, and notice the terminology that the Holy Spirit used, the feast of the Jews. This was one of the seven feasts. It was actually the feast of Passover, which was a type of the death of our Lord on Calvary. <laughs> But notice the Holy Spirit did not identify it as the feast of the Lord. But he called it the feast of the Jews. In other words, he was insulted. And the reason, of, reason for that terminology was that Israel was backslidden. They were religious, but they were not spiritual. It was no longer a feast unto the Lord. But it was nothing more than religious ceremony. We have become proficient in the modern church today. We know the songs. We know the lingo. We know when to raise our hand. We know what to do here, what to do there. And it becomes rote. It doesn't have any meaning to it anymore. It becomes ceremony. Listen, you've got to have a move of God in your own heart and in your own life. You can talk about revival. Revival doesn't start in the masses. It starts with the one. You want a move of God? Let God move in your own heart and life. Don't worry about anybody else. Let God move in your heart. But it's become ceremony. There's no joy in the service. There's no spirit of God. You know, I, 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 I marvel at why some people go to the church they go to when it's dead as a doorman. There's only one reason why you should go to the church that you go to. And that, is, that reason must be and only be that the spirit of the Lord moves in the house. And I mean, when the spirit of the Lord moves, Something good is going to happen. Somebody will get saved. Somebody will get healed. Somebody will get delivered. Something good will happen. But we so control the moving of the Holy Spirit that He's no longer welcome in many of our churches. And I'm not talking about evangelical churches. I'm talking about Pentecostal churches. There's nothing worse than going to a so-called Pentecostal church where the Holy Spirit is not there. I'd rather go to a dentist and have him drill my tooth without anesthesia and to sit in most church sermons. Just dead, 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 dead. They might as well have a funeral, turn off the lights, and go home. of the Jews. It was ceremony. No life. No joy. 
The Holy Spirit must be welcomed in our midst. Not only must be welcomed, He must be sought. He must be desired. As the songwriter wrote so long ago, welcome Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. Oh, hallelujah. The Bible said that there was a pool of water. That pool of water was called Bethesda. In the Greek, Bethesda means the house of grace and mercy. And I love the way the Holy Spirit orchestrates the house of grace and mercy. I don't care what you need it is. You need to get to the house of grace and mercy. I don't care how hurt you are. If you come to the house of grace and mercy, your life will be changed. Amen. And that's what our churches should be. A house of grace and mercy. We, you know, we're living in a time where everybody is screaming justice, social justice. I, I, I'm not a social justice warrior. I'm not woke. I'm not green. I'm not politically correct. I just believe in the power of God. But we holler justice when what we need is grace and mercy. And at this pool of water, the Bible said that at a certain time each season, an angel would come down and trouble the water, meaning move the water. The water would begin to ripple and move. And everyone that was infirm, if they could get into the water while the angel was troubling the water, they would be healed. I had somebody ask me one time, do you? really believe that? Absolutely I believe that. Because that's what the Bible says. And the Bible said that there was a, I noticed the terminology, there was a great multitude of people. And then it described them. It said they were impotent, blind, halt, withered, all waiting for the moving of the water. These descriptive terms halt, blind, Lame are all perfect descriptions of modern people. When he said great multitude, that tells us first of all that there are the masses in this world that don't know Jesus Christ. Over 7 billion people on planet Earth. I, I looked it up one time and I don't remember what the latest statistic is of how many people in the world die every second, but it's static. Every single second. Somewhere in the world, people die. Whether it's through old age, whether it's through murder and crime, whether it's through famine, war, whatever the case may be, murder, whatever it may be. And the reality is the vast majority of them go to hell. They don't know Jesus Christ. They're not saved. A great multitude. That's why the Lord has commanded the church to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. He has commissioned the church to be the evangelist of the world. That doesn't mean that every one of you will preach, but as the old saying goes, the only Bible some people may ever read is the Bible they read in you. And the only Jesus some people will ever see is the Jesus they see in A great multitude. We have to change the way that we see people. When you walk out the door, of this church. Every car you pass, every person that you see on the side of the street, when you go to the mall, when you go to school, when you go to work, you must see those people as God sees them, which is a great multitude. 
multitude that does not know Jesus. Then he said they were impotent. That means feeble in any sense of the word. Those that don't know Jesus are feeble in their mind. The unsaved doesn't think right. I understand that. Hey, you've seen people you know that are not saved and you've, you've had conversations with your wife, your spouse, friends, whatever, and you say, don't, why do they do the things they do? They can't help it. They're blind. Matter of fact, sin is a form of insanity. Makes the person do things that they never would do. Don't ever think that you can play with sin. Sin will take you down further and further. And Here's the reality of sin. I don't care how good you think you are. Without Jesus Christ, there is no word to describe the depth of depravity that we all can sink to. As sin drives further and further. Their feet. They don't think right. They don't act right. They, they don't, they cannot compute. You know, it's, it's amazing. We have people with college degrees, very, very educated individuals, and yet they will, before they will listen to any to a story about Jesus, they will go and buy a bunch of crystals. Uh, duh. They call us stupid. You're the one buying rocks. Hello? You know, it's like I was in, preaching in India one time years ago, and I got into a conversation with a Hindu holy man. And you, you, the Hindu holy men, you, 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 you know them when you see them. They're the ones that wear the diapers. And he spoke very good English and we, we, we got into a conversation. And I, and I said, now, how many gods do you worship? It, it's, it's well over a million. I mean, everything's a god. Don't step on the love, that's your uncle. <laughs> they worship cow. The cow is, they believe in reincarnation, and the cow is the highest form of reincarnation. I'm like, give me a break. A cow? Your religion can't do any better than coming back as a cow? <laughs> Come on now. Think about how stupid that is. And you, in the country, they're starving. And yet there's cows everywhere. Look, I'm not exaggerating. I got out the air, out of the airplane, walked through the airport in Calcutta, India, and there were cows walking through the terminal. <laughs> Are you on this flight? I hope you got a big seat. And the highest form of reincarnation. And I said, you worship this cow, the cow. I said, now, and that's holy to you. Oh, yes. And I said, well, you've got to explain something to me. Oh, what is it? I said, well, I see all over the city pulling wagons with people in the wagon. Oh, yes, yes. I said, but wait a minute. That doesn't make sense. He said, why not? I said, if the cow is supposed to be holy, should the cow be in the wagon and the people pulling the wagon?
brain. Yes, I? It said that they were blind. And in this case, not only physically blind, but a person that doesn't know the Lord. They're spiritual. See, that's the reason why so many sinners will not receive the gospel. They are spiritual. And it, 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 intellectualism cannot present Christ. Your ingenuity cannot present Christ. Your gift of oratory. I, I'm a good speaker. I know how to speak. I've never had anybody get bored. A lot of people get mad. But never bored. Because my job is to make one third of you mad. One third of you sad. One third of you glad. Mad because you don't agree with what I say, but I'm right. Sad because you know what I'm saying is right and you're not living up to it. And glad because you're right with me. Like an old preacher years ago, he said, you know, in the old days, we used to have a lot of negative preaching and a lot of positive living. Now we got a lot of positive preaching and a lot of negative living. But they were. I remember Dad and I were talking one day, and I was, I was like, and I was this years ago, and I just said, but I, I can't they see? And I remember Dad said, you know, Donnie, if a person is physically blind, born blind, they've never been able to see. They don't know the things you're talking about. They don't know what they look. And you can describe a spoon to a blind person all day long. They can touch it. They can feel it. But they cannot visualize it. Because they're in the field. And he said that's the same way with the gospel. Sin blinds and dulls the senses. And you can't see. It said they were withered. It speaks of paralysis. Sin spiritually paralyzed. There's no growth in sin. Dreams and desires fall by the wayside because you're paralyzed. That's what sin. Sin brings fear. And as a child of God, I would say this: fear should never enter in. To a believer's life or a thought because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But they're spiritually paralyzed. They, they, they can't move right. They can't function right. The unsaved cannot walk right. I'm not speaking of physically walking. But they cannot afford it. That, that's the reason why you should never be shocked at the foolishness of the world. It, look, look, look at our governments. We, 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 this whole environmental mess, it's just a bunch of garbage. It's literally a bunch of garbage. The world is not going to be destroyed. Fossil fuel is not going to destroy the world. But they're blind. They're, they're just because they don't know Jesus. With them. They, they don't know. Then it said that they were waiting. In spite of their spiritual condition, the world is waiting for help. The world is waiting. That's the reason why. They all the forest religion. The people are waiting. They're looking here. They're looking there. They're trying to find something to satisfy that craving in their heart. I remember, uh, uh, I guess it was about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I, I just clicked on the television. I was clicking right. I came across the news. And, and I 
saw on the screen one of America's foremost actors. And he's a brilliant actor. Brilliant actor. He was in a court. He had been arrested for probably the eighth or ninth time because of drugs. And I remember the judge looking at him and saying, I told you. And they could bring it out. And then you put ketchup. 
stuff all over it. That steak sucks. You don't even know what the meat tastes like. It's stupid. Or you put mustard on your french fries. It's weird. And you all see some of the worst. Biggest 
lies that Satan tells Christians. And one of the biggest lies Christians fall for is God doesn't see. I'm nobody. I am insignificant. Let me tell you something. He sees you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He knows your name. He knows the good. He knows the bad. He knows the ugly. And he still loves you. He, he sees every tear that cascades down your cheek. He sees every time your heart He sees every time someone lifts their mouth against you and it bruises you. Every sleepless night, He sees it. Here's the beautiful thing about Jesus. He doesn't just see it. He sees it and He will do something about it. If we the Bible said Jesus saw in this man's impotence, his crippledness, he couldn't get to Jesus. But Jesus came to him. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta grab a hold of that. The creator of the world. The one who said, let there be light, and light was, and light continued to be. The one who put the stars in heaven and the psalmist said he has named every single one of them. The one who put the sun and the moon in the right place. The one who created man. The one who created all things. He'll come to you. He'll come to you. Because the reality is we never can get to Jesus. But thank God he came from heaven to this earth for one reason, to meet the need of humanity. Jesus saw him. When Jesus saw him, he saw that need he sees. Yep. What do you need? What, 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 what do you need? Don't tell me you don't need something. Depend on any 
anyone but Jesus Christ. May I put it? May it can I come? I, I, I know in church we're, we're programmed, if I could just get so and so to lay hands on me, they can't heal you. No man can meet your need. Now what we can do is give a word of encouragement. What we can do is that's the best that man can do for you is to pray for you. There's only one that can meet the need no matter what it is. It is the man, Christ Jesus.
people walk around with their great book in and tie-dyed their shirt. Wearing their sandals. Maybe you're all smoking them. Crazy. Everybody's an old hippie in a Just old hippies here. And I was preaching to say, let's bring them out in. So, Saturday night, there was a guy sitting what work we were on the second row. Uh, yeah, had been in the Friday night service, never seen him. Long, long hair. And I preached that night, and I, I, I was not addressing sin. I wasn't addressing salvation. It was another one. And I, I told the people about it. Today. And the Lord spoke to Mars and said, Give it all to God. And we are hard headed. Humanity is hard headed. That's the first thing. Wait a minute. I didn't preach on the side. I didn't really address it like I'm addressing it. The Lord said, Give an offer to God. And I said, But Lord, now I'm battling all this in my mind while I'm praying. Lord, we come to the end of this service and I'm, I'm dragging it out. I'm praying for the bugs that are outside. I'm praying for the birds in the air. Because in my mind, like, I don't, I don't understand. I didn't preach on that. And the Lord spoke to me. You see that? Boy, it's, like, no, yeah. it's for him. Okay. Is that everybody back again? How many I went through want to give you five four? Nobody raised. And I, I started to end it and go on to something else. Okay. No, give it again. It's okay. And I it's said, okay. I want to say it again. Is there anyone? And and I, I was getting exasperated and the Lord said, deal with that young man. And I have to admit, I did not do it. Hey, you on the second row. I'm talking to you. I've never done that before, never done it since. I will never do it unless it happens sometimes. And when I did it, I went, because, look, I'm bold, I say a lot of stuff, but I will never purposely embarrass you. Never. And I said, you need to get saved. I'll never forget you. Are you really saved? The pastor told me 
later. He said he could have come back Sunday. He came to the church the next Wednesday. Walked in and said, I didn't talk to you. He said, I, I accepted the Lord. Could have come Sunday. And I've got a dilemma on my hand. He well, my job is I, I grow pot. I have acres and acres of pot in the woods. It's harvest. I know I can't do that. So what do I do? He said, well, you need to cut it down and burn it. Okay. Then he said, I got a second dollar. Okay, what's that? He said, you remember the girl I was with? Yeah. She lives with me. We're not married. We need to get married. Because I'm not going to live in sin. Jesus said, rise, get up, and instantly, his faith propelled him. He was saved. That poor, distressed, crippled, sinful man came to the house of grace and mercy. And he left. Here's what I came to tell you. Everything I've said is wonderful. Here's my sermon. Whatever you need, get to the house of mercy. That's where you're coming. That is it. All the time of the Lord, the name of your son, Jesus. Would you stand here for you, everyone? Lord, we love you tonight. Just lift your hands and begin to worship.
I need to make there's hands there. I don't have assurance in my heart. I want to make sure that I'll make heaven home. Anyone else? There's a hand. I want those of you, I want to embarrass you, but I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Those of you that raised your hand, I'm going to ask you to step out of your seats and come right here. And I'm just going to pray with you. Just real quick. Come on right now. You raise that hand. That's it, sir. Come on. That's it. Come on, man. This is your time. This is your moment. I'm going to pray a beautiful prayer. I'm going to ask each one of you to say it out loud with me. Putting your faith in not the words, but what the words mean. You're going to believe what the prayer means. Now I'm going to ask every one of you in the audience to say it with them so that their voices not be alone. Say it with me right now. Bow your head, look and lift your hand to the side of surrender and submission. Raise those hands. Those of you standing here, lift those hands. Say it with me right now. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. There's some things in my life that I need to make right. I want to make sure that heaven is my home. And I don't want anything to stand in my way of you becoming Lord of my life. Right now, I surrender my past, my present, and my future to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Everything and anything in my life that is not pleasing to you I give it to you right now. And I want you to make a new person out of me. And right now, I surrender everything to Jesus Christ. And right now, by faith, you become the Lord of my life. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed His blood just for me. And I believe on the third day He rose from the dead. And because He lives, I can live also. And right now, I declare I'm saved. I'm born again. I am a new creation. Christ Jesus. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap for praise. Hallelujah. Well, did you learn something tonight? Did you learn something? Good, good. Was I bored? I'd rather die than be bored. There's nothing worse than a boring preacher. Be back tomorrow. It's at 10 o'clock, right? 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, and 6 o'clock tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, we're going to be ministering on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be praying for believers to be filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Tomorrow morning, believe in the Lord for another great service, and then Monday, I'm heading home. And, uh, but we love you. God bless you. Go back to the table. I've got just a few books left and a few CDs left. And I just want to make sure I don't have to bring anything home. And uh, bring some people with you if you can.